we got on. <laughs> no passcode required. <clears throat> And people are still arriving. It's so great. <clears throat> Just looking at each screen so I can see as many faces as possible. So let's enjoy a few minutes of sitting as a few more people arrive. I'll probably make some reflections during our, our sitting today. <clears throat> As we gather 
online in this way. And then we begin by essentially doing nothing. We forget that the gathering itself, the coming together, the connecting is the central part of the practice. It's so easy to jump ahead of ourselves. What will happen next? When do we actually get to the good part? I remember Joko once saying, just sit every day for six months and see what happens to your life. It's not something that you can explain, but you can discover. And so now we sit together, gathering our best intentions and aspirations for one final time as we come to the end of this calendar year and our final inquiry meeting of 2022. What a year it's been, and we find ourselves once again at this very special time of the year. A time when many natural and spiritual calendars overlap. Advent began late in November and goes through the 24th of December. In the Christian calendar, it represents this, this time, this of anticipation, of arrival, arrival of the embodiment of peace, the birth of <clears throat> great love on the earth, which actually only occurs when the eternal and the human meet. Advent is a waiting period, but not a passive waiting. It's a call for a a quiet revolution of simplicity and solitude, somewhat like Zazen. But a time to make space for something new to appear. The eight days of Hanukkah began this past Sunday, the 18th, goes through December 26. And the commemoration of the rededication of the temple in Jerusalem by the Jewish peoples, and there's so much rich history and symbolism here, which I'm only barely touching. And it's a celebration of light. Represented by the symbolic lighting of the candles and the menorah each day. And much more.
tomorrow, December 21st, the winter solstice. The day of the shortest light of the year in which we go into the darkness from which so much depth comes. Each of these markers on liturgical calendars speaking to enlightenment and endarkenment, how they come together for our awakening. And as we sit now together, we rest in that deep silence and stillness that Advent invites The invitation to be patient and open, inviting without grasping. And as the new day dawns so late tomorrow on the solstice, we know it as a turning day, a literal tipping point of the planet. And of the year we mark by Earth's passage through space and its relationship to light. And those who observe Hanukkah bring new light into their homes by lighting each candle. For eight days, making our way back into the light to come. Early in this season on December 8th was the day we celebrate as the Buddha's Enlightenment Day. We celebrate this human transformational possibility for us all to realize our own true nature, to express it in the world. And at the end of these seasons, of course, for some, Christmas arrives, whether as a religious observance or a secular holiday. It's the arrival of a formless field of benefaction. bringing with it all the forms that we engage of gift giving, food sharing, family gathering, and all that comes along with these conditioned things is few, infused with a deep hope of harmonizing all being. space of waiting, allowing life to come, going into the dark, into the absolute, expressing ourselves in the light, in the everydayness.
celebrating the eternal and the very simple human and where our humanity and our eternal nature meet is where love is born. Vast is the robe of liberation, a formless field of benefaction. Wearing the universal teaching, I realize the one true nature, thus harmonizing all being. Vast is the robe of liberation, a formless field of benefaction. Wearing the universal teaching, I realize the one true nature, thus harmonizing all being. Vast is the robe of liberation, a formless field of benefaction. Wearing the universal teaching, I realize the one true nature, thus harmonizing all being. <clears throat> So many of you um, offered um, such kind reflections on our um, very eventful brief inquiry last week. Uh, so thank you for receiving my reflections and for uh, echoing back the things that were moving in you. Uh, a lot of you let me also know that, <clears throat> pardon me, I'm recovering from some sort of respiratory thing. I'm feeling pretty good, but my, my system is clearing itself out. Many of you let me know how much you appreciated some of the things that I offered on my election day reflection back in November, and particularly uh, the longer narrative poem, uh, Gate A4 by Naomi Shihab Nye. Um, it was such a touching and beautiful expression of how one wants to live one's life. And, so I thought to bring another of her poems to you today on this final day as we approach Christmas and through these holidays. Um, one that you may not have heard before, um, but of course it's, I found it appropriate for the spirit of the season. It's, um, it's honest, it's humorous, a little cheeky. It speaks truth and offers very important teachings well beyond the Christian context uh, out of which it's written. And for me, it includes these qualities, which I mentioned during our sitting, uh, the qualities uh, from Advent about um, spacious anticipation rather than landing on belief. Um, in Hanukkah, you know, rekindling the essential spirit in the face of loss, the soul is us going willingly into the dark uh, without the need of, a, of an answer. And of course, Christmas with the birth of of that essential liberating uh, force within us, which was embodied in the, the story of Jesus. But so here's a Naomi Shihab Nye's poem <laughs> titled, I feel sorry for Jesus. So it's a, a bit of a, a humorous sound. And there is uh, in the poem, there's one thing that some of you may not be familiar with. There's a reference to the Via Dolorosa, which is the uh, term that's used for the route believed to have been taken by Jesus through Jerusalem on his way to Calvary, he was carrying the cross in that story. But it also refers in literature to any, um, a reference to any difficult journey or process or deep uh, transformational path. So just in case you don't know that. Uh, so, so here's the poem, and I'm going to read it, I'm going to reflect on it, and then I have uh, an, another um, riff on it, which I think hopefully will, will call forward something for your own reflections. So here's uh, uh, Naomi Shihab Nye's 
I feel sorry for Jesus. People won't leave him alone. I know he said, wherever two or more are gathered in my name, but I bet he regrets it some days. Cozily, they tell you what he wants and doesn't want as if they just got an email. Remember telephone? The pass it on game where the message changed dramatically by the time it got around the circle? Well, people blame terrible pieties on Jesus. They want to be a special pet. And Jesus deserves better. I think he's been exhausted for a very long time. He went into the desert, friends. He didn't go into the pomp. He didn't go into the golden chandeliers and say, the truth tastes better here. See, now, I'm talking like I know. It's dangerous talking for Jesus. You get carried away almost immediately. I stood in the spot where he was born. I closed my eyes where he died and didn't die. Every twist of the Via Dolorosa was written on my skin. And that makes me feel like being silent for him, you know? A secret pouch of listening. You won't hear me mention this again. She says, I feel sorry for Jesus. People won't leave him alone. I know he said wherever two or more are gathered in my name, but I bet some days he regrets it. You know, that's that's the good news and the bad news of relational practice, isn't it? It only opens like this with all of us together, caring for each other, coming together. But as one of my good friends, um, who's a Methodist minister, we were speaking about this one day and about this scripture about wherever two or more you are gathered in my name, there I shall be. I said, you know, it really goes it's that's not what it I think it should say wherever two or more of you are gathered in my name, the shit will hit the fan. Because it's kind of like that, you know, that suddenly all these human things come forward, but that's that's the way. That's the Via Dolorosa. That's that's the struggle. And then she goes on about uh, that that folks will will tell you what the teacher wants, what he doesn't want, what he actually meant as if they had the message. And then she uses that image of uh, the game telephone where things change. And over the centuries, over the years, things change remarkably. You know, I grew up in a very Christian environment and it was, some of it was quite difficult and painful, even damaging. Uh, that line, she said, people blame terrible pieties on Jesus because teachers, whether Jesus, Buddha, any of us who step into this role, become a projection screen for everyone's longings and become the lightning rod for our failings and the things that people bring to practice. I remember reading Marcus Borg's beautiful classic book, Meeting Jesus Again for the First Time. And hearing someone speak about what it's like to, to take away some of the, the ways that people had played that game, telephone, and how the teachings have been so distorted. Naomi says, you know, people want to be a special pet, a special student. Um, and then reminding us that he took time away, went into the desert as we have to go sometimes into the silence, into the dark. He didn't go into the special places and say, this is where to practice. No, he, he said, it's here now, practice with this, ordinary circumstances with ordinary people. And then as she continues through the poem, she says, now, now look what I'm doing. Now I'm talking like I know, because it's dangerous. because we so easily take these living truths of our practice and turn them into beliefs. And then real wisdom is squandered. 
the living wisdom of practice. And she speaks about her own, you know, going to the, the Middle East and standing in the place where he was born and where he might have died. And, and, to, and she said, feeling the twist of the Dolorosa on my skin, uh, I, I think it's such a beautiful expression of how a pilgrimage is embodied. It only, you can only do it with your body. And practice is always embodied. And she ends with that quiet statement about all this makes me feel like being silent and listening, listening, which is, I think, the deepest aspect of true prayer, not proclaiming and preaching and pleading, but listening. It's why we spend time in silence and stillness. And she makes that interesting comment at the end. You won't, you won't hear me mention this again, as if speaking more won't won't get us any further. And so as we approach uh, Christmas and move through this, I, I, I thought this was, um, there's sort of a, a, a joyful or playful quality to it, but very, very serious too. But something else came to me and, and that I'll ask uh, Naomi's indulgence as I uh, transform her poem for a minute with all due respect to her and gratitude only I've changed the title uh, and call it Offering Metta for Buddha. So here we go again. People won't leave him alone. I know he said to Ananda that spiritual friendship was the whole of the spiritual path, but I bet some days he can't believe what this looks like. With apparent clarity, fervent practitioners will tell you what he wants and doesn't want, as if they just got an email from emptiness. But remember telephone, the pass it on game where the message changed dramatically by the time it rounded the circle? Well, people ascribe outlandish beliefs to this simple wandering monk. They want to be a special disciple. Buddha deserves better. I think he's been exhausted for a very long time. He left his followers at times and disappeared into solitary retreat, friends. He didn't go into the fancy temples along the way. He didn't go into the golden mansions of his benefactors and proclaim, the truth tastes better here. Now, see, now I'm talking like I know, it's dangerous talking for Buddha. You can get carried away almost immediately. I've never stood wide-eyed in the land where he was born. I can imagine closing my eyes and taking a seat where he sat under the Bodhi tree. Every twist of the road from Varanasi to Bodhgaya could fold in the wrinkles of my aging skin. And that makes me feel like being silent for him, you know? A stupa of stillness and listening. You won't hear me mention this again. Offering metta for Buddha. <laughs> God knows we don't leave him alone either. And Ananda talking about spiritual friendship with the Buddha and the Buddha saying, we can use the whole of the spiritual path. Um, but I bet he can't believe what we've turned it into. You know, this practice isn't for you. It's, it's for all of us. It's for everyone. It's for this gathering. It's for what happens between. It's not something you're going to take away like a Christmas present. And as people practice and think they know, they say, oh, this is what Buddha meant. This is what the, this in ancestors were telling us this is what the the nuns and the, the monks were all about but it ends up being just a pass it on game where we're trying to 
trying to find the truth for, for ourselves. And it goes around the circle, it changes. And people ascribe all kinds of strange things to, to Buddha when actually in Buddhism, there's nothing to believe. There's everything to discover. And of course, people want to be that special disciple, the one who, who wakes up as a teacher. I feel it coming at me. The Buddha didn't go into the fancy temples or the mansions of the benefactors. He went on his own sometimes, left his disciples. Always maintain beginner's mind. Always return to the basic practices. Don't complicate it. Sit down in still stillness and silence and let him come to you. Let the teachings arrive. Like Joko said, just sit every day for six months and see what happens. Not strive hard and see what you can get. And I've, I've never been to India. I've never, I've never followed the Buddhist path there, literally. I've spent time in, in Japan and been to some of those beautiful temples. But ultimately, whatever pilgrimage you make and whatever path you take, it's got to end up in your body, in your own skin and bones, your own heart and mind. Or else it's just some idea. And that's where we turn things into beliefs we think we can have, and then true wisdom, the living wisdom, a practice gets squandered. And so all this makes me feel silent. A stupa, a memorial, uh, a place of relics, of, of stillness and listening. And then that last line she said about, you won't hear me mention this again. You know, Zen, our practice, is, was spoken of as a special transmission outside the scriptures, not dependent on words and letters, pointing directly to the human heart and mind, seeing into one's nature and attaining the way. It's, it's not about a new scripture, a new Bible, a new, it's, it's in our bodies, in our relationships. So I hope that this doesn't seem too strange to go from the, the reflection on Jesus' life in this time and the reflection on, on Buddha <clears throat> and how these two, uh, teachers who who brought their teachings out of their tradition in which they were born you know the buddha was never a buddhist there was no buddhism the buddha was a hindu but he realized something that took him beyond in that culture and that and what he realized echoes through the last 2,500 years and remains today because it, it blew him out of that tradition. Just as Jesus was always a Jew, he was never a Christian, there was no Christianity. But as the great Bodhisattva, his teachings and his way of being also propelled him further in some way. It has made some echo over the last two millennia. And here we are, whether we call ourselves a Buddhist or Christian or Jewish or Islam or, or anything, or on the solstice, some shamanic pagan, it doesn't matter what we call ourselves. What's, what's true? What's real? Where's the place where love is born? So if you have questions or places you'd like to meet, please, please come forward. A caveat, I'll, uh, I don't know why I want to say it, but I think it's important to remember that this is not a substitute for psychotherapy. Uh, sometimes I know things can kind of go that direction a little bit. 
What's the deepest questions in your heart? What are the places that want to be opened? And silence is fine. Hey, Kath. Um, I got a new lamp. I feel very golden laid lit. Great. Um, thanks so much for the uh, email of uh, the password, passcode emails, password email. Yeah. <laughs> I went through all of those myself. <laughs> Even tried logging in, you know, to, to do things that way. Um, and, uh, but what I've noticed is that with each one of those strategies that it felt very incorporated, I was just like, oh, yes, makes perfect sense. I liked the, the turn in each of them. And the, but the, the last one, bow and walk away, is I guess what I'm noticing is that it, it seems to be so entwined with the grief or of the expectation of it not not being that way and I get that uh, you know that if I want to fight with something that I'm actually really really close with that because I want to touch it I want to change it I want to control it uh, so I guess that I'm trying to, to to come to a place where I can I keep telling myself like to accept the grief like this is just the grief that comes with something closing and um that that's that it seems to be okay but i don't seem to be very open to experiencing the grief mm -hmm. um so that's the grief that you experience is is the not wanting to have it i mean I, I don't uh, quite understand. you're having something you're uh, you're reporting something let, let me turn it back a little bit. Yeah. You reported that I said uh, bow and walk away. But I said something closer to bow and step back. And step away, not walk away. So one is walk away has more permanence with it? Well, what I'm, my at least my present interpretation is there's no turning your back. Bowing, stepping back is different than bowing, walking away. And in bowing, stepping I, back. I, 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 yeah, I, 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 okay. You keep, you keep facing, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. including that which doesn't want to face. Or is the other one is more of a closing and it's the closing that causes more of the grief. And that's what you experience most of your life, Cass, is people turning away. even that Jesus stuff. Yeah. And so it's painful and it's difficult because you know there's some off about it. But to bow and step back and, uh, and to unblend, to make some space, but keep facing, even the part that doesn't want to face, that takes more courage. Yeah, I'm biting my lip even as you say it. So I know, yeah, that's... You stepped up first. You raise your hand first. I, I'm in love with the process. That's the bowing. And the stepping back is just not staying entangled, but continuing to face. Yeah, okay. I see that 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 it's yeah okay I still I I, I see the, the the tangle of still being in the tangle and thinking there's the expectation the that it'll be resolved it'll be fixed it'll be relieved oh that it were yeah the continual turning toward over and over and over is our continual sitting together and turning toward each other and chanting with each other caring for each other and that you've done steadily since the first day that i met you
Thanks. You've never stopped. Thanks. I had. <sighs> What's that? Okay. Um, I had a conversation with a friend recently, and it was just like out of the blue. It wasn't connected to anything else. And she made a statement of, I know the calmness of people that, you know, sit and you don't have that. And it just really knife wounded me. Um, people want to tell him what he meant and what he didn't mean. Yeah. Uh, remember? Mm -hmm. You become the projection screen because you've begun to move into a role of teacher, leader, otherwise, you know, and so you're going to get projected on. Yeah. So you bow, you step back. We have Jill next. Hi, Jill. Hello. That was nice. I enjoyed what you said to Kathy. Mm. Uh, as you're waiting to come, it changes, doesn't it? Because you hear <laughs> what the other person's, yeah. Yeah. Although, I did want to share some reflections that I had. It's my first day of my holidays today, and I was sitting in bed this morning reading your your reflections mm -hmm. from last week, and and I smiled at the end of it because, or in summary, because actually it hadn't even occurred to me that there had been a technical issue. I just thought I was doing something wrong. Uh, yeah. yeah. That's so, a little bit of a strategy, isn't it? Okay. <laughs> it must be. Um, but what was amazing was last Tuesday um, when I couldn't get in and I didn't know what was happening. I then just went on to another previous inquiry and had a nice time and that was fine. And so what was really different uh, was that I didn't feel badly about myself or I didn't feel badly about what was happening that I couldn't get in or it was there was something um, just straightforward of it not happening and uh, um, and I think I wanted to speak about so it's probably been well I've just been thinking about actually how my life has really changed in this last year since my practice has become more committed mm -hmm. and you know in terms of what you're saying around just see what happens when you sit for six months every day and it feels like lots is happening mm -hmm. and kind of very profound moment for me was a conversation I had with my daughter a couple of months ago and she had been talking about um, wanting to do a postgrad in journalism. And so I thought my answer was quite straightforward or my response, which was, well, you, you may better do a bit more writing. And, uh, and she came back to me with, God, what, why do you always have to have a task? Why can't you just go, oh, great idea, Maddie? Or, you know, why does it? And I was a bit like, oh, I think she's been a bit defensive. And so we had a bit of a sparry conversation and we left each other. And, and then I really just allowed myself to really reflect. And, and I think, and I thought, yeah, that there was something underneath the layers of what felt very kind of, fine advice and a kind of loving place underneath that there was a there was an urgency there was something of okay well I, I think I need to let you know what you need to do in order to do this thing and then when I got underneath that I realized that 
actually there's something about me having an attachment to her doing well because something about if she fails or hits bumps then that becomes about me and there was something about me facing a kind of absolute fundamental part of me that feels a failure and yeah. how I've really allowed that to be part of my bricks and mortar that that will always be with me mm -hmm. and one of those core beliefs it's it's like it's in my bones and but it's paradox, paradoxically feeling so profoundly freeing because I don't have to defend or control so much and that so I just felt and the, that we example of oh it's you know it's me that can't get in but I didn't feel badly for not getting in so I just yeah. wanted and so that's one of the great benefits of practice is you come to that place as I spoke about where it's like, oh, now this. Yeah. Oh, uh -huh. uh, instead of the way that you've organized yourself so much in the past, but what you just described about what you did with um, the initial comment, your reflections, where you went deeper, that's also a beautiful, that's like the going into the dark. Yeah. That, you, that you can allow yourself to because a lot of people aren't willing to do that or don't have a capacity for that and so that's a that's another fruit of of practice which then benefits not only you but all those around you <laughs> so i was really and i feel really moved but that just kind of sense around self-acceptance what a radical thing that is and i'll say it in a kind of a backward way also because you're uh, the way you're talking about it's really important when you said this was in my bones this is how i was organized i know this will be with me and so self-acceptance is a, a beautiful ex uh, fruit of, of practice one time in a retreat when we were in the lakes someone asked me what is zazen and i said i think it's the practice of continually forgiving yourself for being yourself and so it's, it's not exactly the way of saying self-acceptance, a little different. But that's what I heard you expressing. Yeah. This willingness to forgive yourself for being yourself, not because there's something wrong, but it, because of it's a tenderness yeah. that moves in a very different way. Just like that different way that Cassie was talking about. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you just for all your guidance. Thank of you. Of course, of course. It's only possible if you come forward. <laughs> we have Graham. Hey, Graham, come closer, huh? Hey, Flint. Good to see you. Good to see you. I'm just going to move things around a bit. Wow. Thank you, Maria. Okay, wow, what an opportunity. Welcome to Mozendo. Oh yeah, have a seat so I can see you. <laughs> hey. Oh, so wanted to reach out today. Um, been so busy recently. Um, not found this time to um, be with Sangha. Um, and then this curveball today, I just thought, hang on, <laughs> there's an opportunity just to be supported um, with um, the whole community, and particularly with you, Flint. So, hmm. What's in your heart and mind right now that wants yeah. to? It's um, dealing with um, 
not being heard, being rejected, and so wanting to meet with my ex to talk about our eldest daughter together, um, and not being allowed to do so, <laughs> and accepting that there are, um, yeah, pressing issues for that person, so they don't see that need that I have, and yet then to be accused of being aggressive and bullying and forced teaming and all these phrases, I have no idea what they mean, but... So what's your practice that, in all of this? This is the narrative, this is the story. Huge. It's huge. Now, what's your practice edge, though? Okay. Yeah, in other words, there's obviously relationship tangles and feelings, of course, that those are, those are big. What's yeah. your practice edge? So it's about... How easily I am so um, still vulnerable and react with anxiety, heart racing words, and my practice edge. Mm. What can you bring to this situation? Well, it's. They're not going to take care of you. This is probably going to go on. No, it's, it, yeah, absolutely. And, and what can you bring? What freedom, what bit of possibility can you bring? Okay. I've got to the point where I can forgive, I suppose, um, my eldest daughter because we're both victims in what's, what's happened. So that's a good place to be. You can bring forgiveness. Yeah, I can bring forgiveness at last, at last. And the, and the possibility of just continuing on with them not having to solve any problem for you. <laughs> yeah, there's the edge. Yeah, that's what I think. Yeah. They're not gonna make it okay for you. Mm. And, and we're not I don't know how to solve these problems, of course, yeah. but how are you going to meet them? Yeah. I, I find it hard because I, 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 I yeah, pers I, I would love to be able to just not talk about this, but be able to just digest. And, and yet I've got this strong urge just to ask for help and say, hey, what have I done wrong? I, I, I'm right. I'm right. I'm the right one here. And, and, and has, that, that hasn't helped, has it? No. <laughs> We're going to solve the problem. No. Can you, like any of the any of us, say, uh, I've had a difficult time. Uh, can you be with me? It's like, yeah, I can be with you. Yeah. And I so Without being tangled in the stories, just be with you. Okay. Okay. I think what's important for me, I don't give this to my new partner and I just try and contain this because that's what's tricky for me. It's wanting to oh, just be held. Well, you just transfer that it, your former family will take care of you about this or your new partner will take care of you about this. So looking for, a, looking for uh, an ultimate caretaker who's going to solve all this, or maybe Flint will take care of it or... So, you know that's the that seems to be the threat, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Graham, this is about you making a firm commitment. Yeah. You will take care of yourself, no matter yeah. what happens, no matter how yeah. it goes. Yeah. I. Yeah. Yeah. Not easy, and also. Um, I'm. I, yeah, it's it's accepting that all people can be is alongside me. You can't be in my shoes. And and you're responsible yes, for your life. I um, we we'll, we can be responsive to yeah, your, your life. And it's being responsible for these angry, uh, torn, hurt feelings. Where yeah, and these are the things that once again. Like I said earlier, we don't want to get into psychotherapy about all this. Yeah. Because that's another venue. Yeah. You can you can work through those things which are important to do so. Yeah. 
the practice is about finding the one who is the spacious container for all of those things that move. You can work with the contents of your consciousness, with your feelings, with your thoughts, but the spaciousness is what your zindo, that's what's in the, your hand in the cosmic mudra there. Yeah. I'm back to that. I sit each morning here for 15 minutes every morning around about seven, half seven, and have done so since being at Plum Village in the summer because I've continued that practice. Although I've not been to all Sangha meetings, I have my own practice and yoga stretches and that. I know I'm going to have to do that twice as hard tomorrow. <laughs> well, it's good to see you again. It's been a while. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Yes. It's a, um, a kind of a tough place, I think, when we come to realize that at the bottom, that there is no ultimate savior, but there is saving, uh, freeing, as our practice invites, by our shared committed um, practice of seeing the truth, telling the truth, living the truth, no matter what happens. Because so, subtly we change it into, and this is in the, the poem, uh, we heard this, changing it into, if I do the practices, then it will go well. If I do the practices right, then it will turn and things will be healed. Everything will finally be relieved, I'll finally be at peace. Things will... You can practice all you want, but sometimes things continue to be complex. How do you find that still pocket of silence from the poem or that stillness of stupa that holds the treasure uh, that our practice invites over time? And that, that's, uh, it doesn't sound very consoling. It sounds more confronting. And yet it's the part of the passcode to freedom And we have, uh, oh, Jay, we have a couple minutes. Good. Come on. I see the hand. There she comes. All right. Um... The Wi-Fi in here is really bad, so hopefully you I guys you. can hear me okay. okay. Yeah. So, no, um, <laughs> I just wanted to say and really quickly how it's always interesting when the, the message and um, the sharing line up so um, perfectly, and I was thinking it's not by accident because in hearing Cassie's story, you know, uh, for me, I translated it to that I am Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, people are always going to project their idea of what things look like for me. You know what I mean? And if I meet 10 people, they, I, they're going to have 10 different views of who I am and what I should do. So, you know, that's not mine to take, you know, and it's just interesting how um, <laughs> we hold, like I for myself, I've held on to, well, you don't appear to be that whatever ABC. And then I'm like trying to match their idea of what ABC is. And, you know, I lose my, you know, I, I reject myself because I'm trying to reach their ideal. And it's like, you know, uh, it's so, you know, like I, I know for myself now how silly that has been because in saying yes to them, I'm saying no to who I am, my core and what that looks like. And you know what, if, I'm the dandelion and you're the rose. I need to be the best dandelion I am because I came here to be me and not you. You know what I mean? So, yeah. I, I, so your story of, oh, I feel, yeah, bad, <laughs> bad for Jesus and everybody's viewpoint. And I, it really sunk in for me that is it any wonder we have all these different versions of Christianity and Buddhism because everybody has their own idea of what that looks like. And it's okay. You know, so I welcome it all. And if you think that 
you know what? You don't look um, peaceful or serene or zen. <laughs> you know, like um, Cassie referenced in your post last week. Take a step back, bow and say thank you. And then step back from that. You know what I mean? Like, it's a beautiful that, right? thing, I think, when and thanks for line up that way. So thank you. Thank you. It reminds me of one time um, <laughs> Bill Weissman said to me, you know, our job in practice is not to take offense, even when it's meant. <laughs> to let it go. Thank you, thank you. And thank you everyone. We're here at the end of our time uh, and at the end of the year, it's our last inquiry uh, of the year. We won't be meeting next week. We'll have a little bit of a break, but continue your practice and enjoy these holidays as best you can. And let's recite the four practice principles just to remind us of what Jay was just meaning. <laughs> Caught in the self-centered dream only suffering, holding to self-centered thoughts, exactly the dream. Each moment, life as it is, the only teacher, being just this moment, compassion's way, caught in the self-centered dream, only suffering, holding to self-centered thoughts, exactly the dream. Each moment, life as it is, the only teacher, being just this moment, Compassion's way, caught in the self-centered dream, only suffering, holding to self-centered thoughts, exactly the dream. Each moment, life as it is, the only teacher, being just this moment, compassion's way. And thank you all for your presence and for your support through this entire year, and I look forward to a new year with you. Thank you so much, Flint. And thank you, like Flint said, to everybody for turning up week after week all the way through the year, you know, each year so that we can all practice together. It really does support me and each and every one of us. So thank you all so much. And if you'd like to offer Dana to Flint, then please do go to the um, appamada.org forward slash contribute and you'll see an opportunity there to offer Dana to teach us to Flint and just put put Flint's name in or to Peg and who's also here this evening and um, any for any other events that you'd like to offer Dana to it's so much appreciated thank you all so much and if you'd like to continue to meet and share then please do pop yourself into gallery view and I'll join you all for a further 30 minutes so thank you and see you all on the 3rd of January <laughs> for the next one.